Everyone, good evening. Welcome everyone, it's only well tonight. We are going to... Yeah, this is going to be our uh, last session before the final presentation. And uh, we will finish uh, all the material, hopefully by tonight. Uh, so there's a couple more left. By the way, how many people finished uh, the lab work last week? Two? Two and a half? Yeah, two and a half. <laughs> all right, two and a half people. Only that, that's it? Were you, were you able to classify your email as spam? Yes. You take as spam? No, it doesn't work. It didn't work? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's okay. It didn't work. work. Yeah. So it really yeah. depends, yeah. Depends on the email that you have selected. And the model is not like super accurate or anything, but. So, and the features that have been selected in this model are probably not very much up to date. Uh, yeah, is this 1990? What, the accuracy? No. What? Oh, you made the code? 1999. Are you sure? Yeah. I checked the... Oh, interesting. That's why. Yeah. So, this is exactly how Yahoo works. This is probably Yahoo's spam engine for classifying spam emails. Yeah, it's probably using something in 1990s or 80s. And so, yeah, but cool. At least... Three people, three and a half people, got it running. Um, so again, if you didn't get the time to do it, please, you're gonna have a, still a few weeks left until the final project. You can do it during this time, and then next time uh, when we meet, if you have any questions, you can let me know. Okay. All right. So I'm not gonna go through the spam script unless you have any questions uh, for tonight. Well, there's a lot for clustering. We're just, we're just gonna look at it and see if you have any questions. Then we're gonna get into association reminding. Association reminding is one of the most influential algorithms in the retail world. And data mining, and data science, it's really important. It's really important. The reason is because, as I said, there's uh, tons of applications for it. Many, many applications. Like in cases which, if you're a data scientist and people give you a data set and tell you, uh, do you have any ideas on this data set? Okay, like that general, you can come up with association rule mining applications in it, on it, for sure. You can easily find it. So we're gonna talk about it. Uh, we're gonna spend like maybe half an hour. And we'll talk about real world application on health insurance data uh, by applying association rule mining. And finally, we're gonna start doing web scraping in R. And the last topic is gonna be a new package called Shiny for creating interactive web apps in R, okay? So you don't need to use PHP, HTML, or any other language. You can just use Shiny and R, and it's way simpler than any other uh, web app programming language. All right, and finally we have a bunch of lab works, and then just goodbye until three weeks. All right, so no class for next week, and uh, we're gonna meet on, uh, is it 29th or 30th of, yeah, I think December, no. Uh, when is it? December? No, November. Right? End of November. So we're going to meet end of November. Uh, again, if you have, uh, so, uh, so we're going to have a class on 29th and 30th. And it depends on your avail availability. If you want to present on Thursday or Friday, no difference. Okay? You can just show up at either of the sessions. Just make sure that all of your teammates can you know, make it to that session. Um, all right. Any questions? So far? Uh, we had this uh, clustering lab work from last time. Was anyone able to do this? Maybe just three and a half people? Yeah? I need to know from us. Uh huh. Yeah, most of the cases cluster. So we have to use it. We have to add some code. Yeah. Yeah, not necessarily. So the output of clustering is. Um, is uh, like a variable, yeah. and then inside the variable, there's a, a feature called cluster, which is going to give you the cluster labels for all of the instances in your data set. Right? So you can either add those cluster labels to your MPG data set as a separate column, or you can still just keep it there and then use it for uh, labeling or giving co uh, like different colors to the data points just to see if visually if they're going to fall in the same cluster. Okay, so this is very similar to the, remember the iris example that we did during class? And we showed like all different species uh, when we did clustering, they fall in the same cluster almost. Uh, the same thing here. 
Okay, so I hope everyone has done this. I don't see that, but um, yeah, I've done this. No? Yeah, I took guess. Um, but again, if you have any questions, let me know. Maybe at the end of the class, if we have time, which probably we don't, um, I can write the code. Okay? All right, let's jump into association of mining. Not, we don't want to waste time right now. And uh, so we have enough time to um, focus on some of the details because, again, it's a very important, uh, very important topic. I'm going to start off with this. The future of retail is the grab-and-go technology. <coughs> is everyone familiar with Amazon Go? Yeah. Right. So Amazon Go is, I think it was uh, introduced like two years ago, maybe, by Amazon, which uh, you go inside the store, purchase, and not purchase, like grab any items you want, and then just run away. Um, everything is going to be charged automatically, right? Detected, and your credit card is going to be charged automatically. So this is obviously the future of retail. I mean, very near future, not even, uh, not even uh, like in a few years, maybe just like this year, because uh, uh, Amazon has set up uh, like two, three stores, I think in Seattle right now, two stores in Chicago. They're also opening a few in San Francisco this year. And uh, where? San Francisco? Where is it? Okay. Which city is it? Yeah, exactly. In San Francisco, is that the city? Do you know which area, which street? Or? I was, yeah, I'll be correct. That's nice. I'll go tomorrow. It's, it's open. Oh, really? You've been there? No, I went to the Seattle one. The Seattle one? Okay. Yeah, the, the first store that they opened was only open to Amazon employees. Yeah, I like, couldn't make it inside. But I think the second one was like open to everyone. Cool. And uh, so the way that this works is Amazon is using, of course, AI, deep learning, you know, and especially in computer vision for detecting the objects from using cameras. It's doing image recognition or using array of fusion sensors. That's why tons of sensors you can see on the ceiling, like cameras and also sensors for detecting items. And also, something that is really interesting, that you also use decades of data on, on how humans shop. Okay? And it's very cool, like if you pick an item and then decide to put it back, they can detect that. Okay? And this is like super smart because they can easily not only record or not only monitor the items that you purchase, but even your shopping behavior, right? For example, if you pick an item and put it back, it means you're somehow interested in that, in that item, but maybe the price was like too high or something. So they're gonna send a coupon to your house before you get home. And that means that you will, obviously you're gonna purchase it next time, right? So that's how they make money, you know? This is like super smart. They're pushing to open 3,000 stores by 2021. And what does that mean? That means the rest of the grocery stores yeah. are gonna go bankrupt. Yeah, just like how what happened to Sears and other department stores that are closing one by one right now, Toys R Us. All of them are gonna be closing soon. And well, Sears is officially bankrupt, right? After 132 years of operation in the US. And uh, Walmart is trying to catch up with technology, right? They have this Walmart research lab. I don't know if anyone is working at Walmart here. They, they're paying very well. And, uh, and the reason is because they want to catch up with Amazon. So it's really nice, I mean, like, because there's some competition here in the market, uh, that's, why it, that's why it's growing so fast. I mean, technology and retail is like growing so fast. And it's mostly because of Amazon. Or they acquired Whole Foods, right, six months ago. And it's kind of obvious what they want to do. They want to create a Whole Foods cashier free Whole Foods. So you go like no cashiers, no line, organic stuff. And then is there any reason for going to Safeway? Not at all, okay? So they're gonna shut their doors soon. And uh, so, yeah, but something that is really important is uh, what is the, you know, data mining algorithms that is used in retail analytics? Does anyone use this one? Switch to the user. Anyone else? So this website, you can just go there. It's pretty cool. Just try it out once. Um, and uh, it's gonna ask you a couple questions, like what color you like, what style you like, which brands you usually wear, um, all that question. So it's like, and then it creates like a kind of like a smart decision and picks, you know, some items for you. And uh, it's gonna send like a box to your house with like 10 items, shoes, everything. And then you're just gonna try them on, whatever you like, you can keep and then just 
uh, give back to us, okay? Just return the rest of the items. Uh, it's pretty cool, you can just try it out. And it will give, get your feedback, and that means their model will retrain, improve, right? Use that feedback, so next time it's gonna make some wiser decisions. It's probably gonna send more relevant items to you, right? Um, so again, tons of algorithms, tons of applications. Uh, the topic that we want to discuss tonight is called market basket analysis. So all of these technologies that we're talking about and all these recommendation engines especially used in the market and retail is all based on this topic, market basket analysis. So in general, this concept means um, based on customers' transactions and their, and their shopping behavior, what are the items that are bought together most of the time, for example? Like, this is an example here in this figure. Like, Customers who buy this item also buy these items, for example. So this means that in the future, if, if we can somehow learn this from customers' data, from transaction data, it means that in the future, if a customer purchases banana, we can give them some coupons for like carrots and other that items as well. Because we know there's a high probability that they're also gonna be interested in these items, okay? So that's why all these recommendation engines are based on this, on this concept. And it's not only used for recommendations, it's also used for store layout. So if you can find out the items that come well together, you can put them in the same location at the store. So this time when you go shopping, like it's, I've, I've paid a lot of attention to this, like when you go to Costco, just look at the items, right? And you will see that you know all the relevant items are like in one place, in, in the same location. So if you're looking for one of them, you can find a relevant item, and the other one is probably in the same area. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna give you some examples here. So, after this. So again, all these recommender systems, not only in Amazon, like Spotify, Facebook, Netflix gives you recommendations, what to watch in the movies. Again, this is based on, uh, you know, like the movies that you've watched, how much time you spent on the movie, uh, how many times did you watch it, you know, and also it like clusters all the, uh, you know, the different um, users and gives the same recommendations like the other cluster and so on and so forth. So tons of, again, data mining stuff going on here in machine learning. Uh, or, and Google obviously is also using that. Or Spotify gives you, again, some suggestions and recommendations of what to listen to, right? Or SoundCloud is also the same, uh, pretty much. And Amazon, you've seen like tons of examples like this. Customers who bought this item also bought these items, right? You've seen this a lot. We're gonna see like how Amazon is creating this and how they're uh, pulling out this information from transactions data, or like you will see frequently bought together. Okay. So all of these recommendations fall under the concept of association rule learning. Okay, So there's a very important algorithm in game mining called association rule mining or learning, and uh, which is like really important, especially in retail, because you can see like there's a, a lot of benefit, right? A lot of advantage of using these, these algorithms. So these are like some examples and real rules extracted from real data, from real transaction data from users. And uh, this is how we interpret these rules. So we're gonna say that most of the customers who purchase onions and potatoes also purchase burgers. Okay? So this time when you go to Costco, you're gonna see all these three items in the same area. I was once looking for, I don't know, like potato, I couldn't find out. I found burgers first, and then I found potatoes right next to it. Uh, or most of the customers who purchase flour and sugar, they also purchase eggs because they want to make cake. cake. This one is intuitive and simple, but not all the rules are intuitive. For example, most of the customers who purchase diapers and milk also buy Coke. Yeah, it's real. It's based on real data. No, I don't believe. Yeah. See, it's not intuitive. It's not intuitive. Yeah, that's me. that's why I'm angry. I think the real example was beer, not coke. I replaced it, maybe. But but anyway, still not very not very obvious, right? I think I replaced it. Yeah, just because I don't drink, that's why. I don't know, but yeah, I was a little biased here. I'm sorry. Or for example, most of the customers who purchase Apple items and play Pokemon Go are interested in pasta. How could that be? Well, I made this up, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Only this one. But the, rest, <laughs> but the rest of the rules are based on real data, okay? based on real transaction data. And, uh, and not all of them are intuitive. I mean, you can look up like a whole list of these, uh, trend, uh, these correlations, 
in these associations, and many of them are not really intuitive, intuitive at all. And then you can simply even expand these rules. Like if there's three items here, and then you can give recommendation for like two items, or three items, or four items, or five, you, you can easily expand, so it can get a lot, very complex, very complex. Something that you cannot do, you cannot extract these rules manually from millions of transactions um, that happen on, on Amazon, right? There's no way you can do that manually. It's not possible. We have to use this association rule algorithm to figure this out. Now, let's get into some of the details of the algorithm and let's see how it runs in R, okay? How it runs in R and how the, these rules are going to be generated, what do they mean, and we're also going to talk, talk about some of the scoring metrics here. Uh, so, uh, first of all, there's a few definitions here. We have a list of items in the association rule mining, which means the list of items, right? It's, I think, very obvious. Like, in a supermarket, the items are potato, uh, diapers, and Coke, blah, 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 right? These are the items that uh, are purchased by customers at least once. And then we also have a set of transactions. So the set of transactions means the items that were purchased together. And the order doesn't matter, obviously. Right? Or like the items in, in your basket in one transaction. Now, the definition of transaction, you can, you can modify this. Transact like this definition, for example, because I mean, maybe someone is going to purchase like five items, but in three separate transactions. But well, we can combine them if they were done in the same day. Well, we can combine them and create just one transaction for that. Okay, or for example, in some cases, like in we're going to talk about it, like drugs and medicine and, and prescriptions. If someone purchases or gets a, like a prescription or some drugs in like a, a whole week, we can combine it and create one single transaction because they're probably associated to the, you know, the same uh, disease or disorder, right? Anyway, so we have all the items that are purchased together called transactions. And finally, after we run this association rule learning algorithm, the outputs are gonna look like this. We're gonna have an LHS and RHS. LHS means left-hand side, okay, for example, and RHS right-hand side. So this means that most of the customers who purchased these items together also purchased this item or items. Okay, I mean, obviously we can expand this. It doesn't necessarily have to be one item. Okay, and uh, so that's it. Now, the probability here is a score. We're going to talk about it. Okay, what do we mean like by most likely? Well, most likely could be like 98%, it could be like 80%, 70%, we're going to talk about that. But in general, all of the rules in association with money are going to look like this, okay? In the previous example, like we had a tomato, no, so I'm sorry, it was a potato and onions here, and then we had a burger here, right? So that's how we interpret the rules. We have LHS, we have RHS, and it means that if LHS happens, or if LHS is purchased by someone, most likely, or with some probability, RHS will also be purchased, or it's going to be there in, in their interest. All right. Um, now, how can we measure the quality of these rules, these of the, the set of LHS and RHS? I mean, how can we sort the rules and say like which one is better and which one is not? We need some accuracy metrics, right? We need to we need to quantify it somehow. Uh, now, what is the first one that comes to your mind? Like what kind of metric do we have? To, I just talked about it right now. Like that probability, okay. right? The probability, the likelihood of the of this rule happening. We're gonna call it confidence. So here it is. The confidence score is actually you know the likelihood that this rule is true. Okay. For example, if it's ninety percent, it means like in 90% of the cases that LHS were purchased together, RHS was also purchased. In the rest 10%, this one was not purchased. All right? So that the accuracy of this rule is like 90%. Okay? And obviously the higher, the better. Right? It means like you have more confidence in that rule. Obviously, I mean, if you can get like 100%, well, that's ideal. But Probably not, not going to happen in your way. All right. Uh, now, is that enough? 
I mean, is this the only metric that we have to look at? Or is there anything else you would think of? Probably it's not purchased. No, other than that. The what? Exactly, the frequency. The frequency, yeah. How often does, does this happen? Because if some rule happens only once, let's say one customer out of one million customers, okay, purchase like some items that fall in this rule. Okay, the confidence is 100%, right? Because it, it happened. It was true. But it only happened once, so we don't care. And if something happens only once or twice among like millions of transactions, it's not important for us. So that brings up another metric called support. So the support score is going to like tell you like what, what fraction of transactions in our data set um, this rule happened. Okay? So these are the two main metrics that we're going to be looking at. Confidence, I think this is even more important. Confidence and then support. There's also another one we don't have in the slide, it's called Lyft. Not Uber, Lyft, okay? It's L-I-F-T, not L-Y-F-T. L-I-F-T. So Lyft means the, like how unique is the transaction? How unique is the rule? Okay, so we usually use confidence of support, but if, for example, if you're generating too many obvious rules, right, especially if you have some domain knowledge in the data set, you can see like some of the rules, like, oh, they're so obvious. Then you can sort them based on Lyft. Okay, Lyft actually shows like, I mean, the higher score means like if they're like more unique uh, um, rules or maybe not very intuitive to understand. And uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Now, so in order to do association with mining or learning, there's a bunch of algorithms, okay, in the, in the literature. But we're not gonna look at any of these guys because 99.9% .9 of the community is using a priori. Okay, so a priori is the most, is the fastest, and most efficient algorithm for doing association through mining. Again, we're not going to go into the details, but um, in the next slide, I have a link which provides details in the algorithm if you want to see like how this really works. Okay, uh, so this is kind of like, I mean, what it does is like looks into different combinations of LHS and RHS, and see, and for example, looks at their confidence score, right? But it's not. It's similar to like feature selection. It's not looking at all possible combinations, otherwise it's gonna take forever, okay? It's using some methods and some indexing for uh, like uh, trimming down you know, the number of combinations and optimizing it, the number of comparisons that it has to make, and eventually finding the, you know, the most optimal and the best rules out of the transaction data set. But anyway, there's a, if you go to this link, you can find tons of details about a priori and see how it works. Again, there's a lot of material on the web if you want to look into it, okay? It's a pretty cool thing. I mean, it's a very nice algorithm, very neat algorithm. And um, uh, so again, this is the, like the uh, state of the art algorithm associated with mining. We, you, don't need to, you don't need to bother yourself learning about other algorithms that exist. This is like number one, it's the state of the art right now. Now, in order to run association with mining in R, okay, we're gonna be using a package called A rules. And there's a function inside this package called a rules again that runs and is a, there's a, it's an implementation of that priori algorithm. It's called a rules, a rules, okay. And uh, the input to a rules is is what? Yeah, the set of transactions. Correct. The set of transactions. So the input is going to be, what do we mean by set of transactions? Let's uh, like consider a data set um, or a spreadsheet, which every row is one transaction. Okay. So let's say in row one, you're going to put like potato, onion. Row two, diapers, Coke, uh, ice cream. Row three, so this means like every row is a transaction done made by a customer. Okay? And obviously the number of items you have in every row is not going to be the same because the number of items in every transaction can be different, right? Um, 
Um, so that's it. All you have to do is just create this input and then plug it into a rules. That's it. Okay. And there's some, some just uh, minor uh, details about the generating or printing the results and the rules. Because, for example, you can sort them based on, as I said, with confidence and, and support and also lift. There's also some functions in the A rule package that will help you to visualize all these rules. Because if you have a, a million transactions or like 1,000 items in your data set, it means the number of possible rules is going to be like many, right? I, mean, I don't know, maybe millions or, or maybe billions, I don't know. It's going to be a lot, right? So you have to trim them down based on, for example, support and confidence. Or you have to visualize them somehow to see like which ones are more interested. Now for doing this, uh, we're not going to do this in the class because it's going to take maybe half an hour. But this is the link. Go to this link. Make sure this is one of the uh, very important map work for next time. Okay, Very important map work. Go through this. It's a very simple tutorial that goes through one example using the Titanic data set. It's a built-in data set in R. And applies a rules to this data set to find meaningful rules in the data set and association. And then again, uses like some type of plots to visualize these rules and associations. So it's beautiful, it's a, it's a very, very nice example. And if you go through this once, um, you will get a very good understanding of like how to run association training. And this is very helpful, I mean, trust me. Uh, many applications, not only in retail only, I'm gonna show you an example in healthcare that, um, that we use association rule mining in it to find associations between drugs. Okay, and um, so again, please go through this example. But eventually when you run this and go through the script, uh, you will see a set of rules like this. Okay, we're gonna interpret some of them. So for example, the top rule is saying that if a passenger belongs to class second, the second class, and their age is a child, with 100% confidence, they survived. And it happened in 1%, of all the transactions or all the uh, passengers, okay? The second one, if a passenger belongs to first class and is a female, they survived with 97% confidence. In other words, 3% of the passengers who belong to first class and were female did not survive, right? And it's the same thing. Okay, so this is what confidence means. And yeah. how do you print the support? Yeah, so this is like, okay, so this is like 6% of all the transactions that we have in the data set. Okay, so it depends on how much data we have. And maybe we don't have data for all the passengers in the data set, okay? So let's say, I don't know, if that's the set of transactions that we define, if it's like 1,000, this is 6% of 1,000. So it's like 60, for example. Okay, so that's what it is. It's not necessarily um, this ratio of the passengers. It's this ratio of the transactions that you have in the data set. Uh, so again, I, I mean, if you go through this example, I think it's a very, very, I mean, you will exactly learn how to use it. And the uh, only trick here is to prepare your set of transactions. So if you have, if you come up with like a different data set that you want to apply in social general mining, all you have to do is just prepare your set of transactions and get it in that format. That's it. So, question. Yeah. So to read this first, you go to the highest support and then choose oh. the highest confidence. Is that how you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when, once you want to print the rules, you can you can say it here, and you'll see it in the tutorial. You can say that okay, I want to print the rules based on confidence and then support and then lift. Okay, so it's gonna sort them first based on confidence, like the highest confidence, you're gonna see the highest confidence, and then you'll see the highest support, and then like, for example, lift. And that's what happened here. This is probably first based on confidence, right? Yeah. The highest confidence, and then also, and then support, and then support. Mm -hmm. Change those combinations? You can change them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a parameter, it's a parameter. Or you can sort them based on only confidence, or only support, or support confidence, or confidence support, and then just imagine you also have lift, so many more combinations. But again, 
make sure you go through this. I'm sure many of your questions are gonna be answered, okay? I mean, maybe it's not very intuitive right now, like how does this work? And, but once you run it, you go through it once, it'll give you a very good idea about how this works. Yeah, question. Yeah. Do we have to use some data type or many other data that you didn't have to set? No, no, it could also be like a spreadsheet. Yeah. I mean, even if you have like a CSV file, yeah. which in every row, yeah. you have the items separated by comma, that's a CSV, right? Yeah. That's it, that can be the input. All you have to do is just import it. Well, once you import it, it's gonna be a data frame automatically, right? And then you plug that into a rules. There's two different formats uh, for, like, the, but I forgot their names. Like, one of them is called basket something. I forgot it, but you'll see it here in the tutorial, okay? But the most common formatting is, as I said, like, you have transactions in every rows, and all the items are separated by commas. Right? The comma doesn't matter, even if you separate them by space or some other character, we can put it there. We can just put it in, in the. In input. all of those, we don't have. We don't have the same number. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. We don't have it. No, no, we don't have it. Okay. So for example, if um, so if you want to put this in a data frame, let's say the first row is going to be like two items, and then the rest is going to be NA, for example, right? If we have N possible items in the data set. Okay. So we're going to have the number of transactions here, and then N columns probably. But for many of them, it's going to be NA, because uh, a transaction could be just like purchasing one item. And that means that n minus one, uh, the rest of the n minus one slots in the, the data set is going to be n. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. All right. You remember the story that happened a few years ago at Target? So the guy uh, went into a Target store and started shouting and complaining at the store's manager. Why are you guys sending pregnancy coupons to my teenage girl? Right? And you know, Target sent a, like a, a lot of apologies and saying, "Oh, we're sorry, this is never going to happen again." And blah blah blah. After two days, after two weeks, the dad calls in and says, "Oh, my teenage girl was pregnant, and I had no idea." So, how did Target realize this, recognize this before the dad? Using association with money. So they had a built-in rule. Target had a built-in rule based on associations that if a customer purchases 19 items together. Again, together doesn't necessarily mean at like one time. It could be like during, I don't know, like two or three weeks, whatever the definition is. If they purchase those 19 items, it means they're pregnant. And that's how they figured out that, you know, this teenage girl is pregnant. This is a pretty controversial topic. You know, a lot of people, especially in these data science you go, they talk about it like, oh, AI is ruining you, you know, or, Privacy, it's taking our jobs. You know, everyone talks about that, that stuff. You know, it's, it's something temporary. You know, and all of this is going to go away because AI is actually happening in our lives. Right? We have to accept it. We have to admit it. Or people say like, ethics is falling behind technology. You know, oh, what happens if like a autonomous car has to make a decision to hit a pregnant woman or hit uh, like a, a, I don't know, like a, a child. Like a child. Okay. What decision is this? You know, th all these stuff is going on right now, and uh, uh, but eventually we have to adapt ourselves, and uh, and we have to make it happen. I mean, the same thing here. I mean, AI uh, is, of course. I mean, it's going to make some predictions that human beings are not are not going to think of, like like pregnancy, and it may it, it it may you know confront privacy at some point. But uh, that's what it is, and it's beautiful. And just look at it as like technology. It's adding. Convenience for life, right? It's just beautiful. Why should we complain about it? Anyway, again, you can read about it here. More details about this story. Now, I was curious to see, like, how much money are companies saving, or how much money are they making out of using association with money? And they found these numbers. It was very interesting. Like, Amazon is doing like fifty-five percent of their sales based on recommendations and prediction predicting demands. 55%, just imagine. Like, that's huge, right? Or uh, like Netflix is using market basket analysis or associated with money, and it's saving them $1 billion per year. $1 billion. Just by giving recommendation of what to watch to users and customers, they're making $1 billion. Best Buy has reported like 27% increase in their revenue. 
And again, various research show an increase in upside revenue ranging from 10 to 50 percent caused by accurate. This was I'm going to take away the conclusion out of uh, reading some articles. All right. So again, it's a it's a very big thing. I mean, if you want to convince someone that associational mining is very important and it can you know uh, help their organization and company to save a lot of money, you can show them some of these stats and some of these numbers. All right. Now, associational mining doesn't really need to be applied only in retail. We can also do it in health. So I'm going to show you a real project. This happened recently. And uh, we actually got access to 1 billion records of health prescription data okay, from an insurance company. Not in the US, obviously. In the US, you cannot do that, okay? Uh, back in my home country. Uh, so we got access to this data. And uh, of course, it was anonymous. I mean, no names, no serial numbers, or no IDs, nothing. Okay. The only thing in the data set was medicine, like prop state or city, gender, and date. That's it. Okay. But I'm going to show you like what very I mean, there's so many valuable things you can extract from this data set. It changes. I, I initially put drug here, but I was doing a presentation and. Uh, I think it was in Australia. And when, once I said drugs, all the whole crowd started laughing, you know? I said, well, what's the problem with drugs? They said, oh, drug means like more wine. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. So I replaced it with medicine for you know, my next presentation. Um, but anyway, if we look at this data as, a, well, I'm gonna explain it so she don't mind, but let's, let's first get into this because, uh, or no. So the first task was, so using all this one billion, well, after cleaning it up, cleaning it up, we had like 300 million prescription data, okay? So 300 million prescriptions over like five years. Um, and uh, the first task was to build a classifier that would classify and label every prescription based on their disease or disorder. Because we don't have that information inside the prescription, right? I mean, the doctors never put the, the reason inside a prescription. All you have is just the drugs in the prescription, that's it. And so we wanted to do, we actually used like a, uh, there was a couple methods we could do. Uh, for example, we could ask, uh, you know, a couple doctors to label like a couple thousand of these prescriptions and then use a neural network to learn and then apply it on the rest 300 million prescriptions. That was one thing, but we didn't do that because uh, there was a simpler approach. We, we used a, we used like a ground truth table for multiple diseases that they were mostly interested in, and come, came up with like a set of drugs that are usually prescribed for each of them, and then use K nearest neighbor to find the closest match. That's simple. Okay. So for example, if a prescription has like two drugs from one category or from one disease, it's most likely that disease. But if it has like one from another, it means that okay, it's most likely category one, but maybe like 50% category two. Okay. Anyway, we came up with, so that's how you see the prescriptions here, right? Like each of these uh, rows have uh, like a few uh, uh, drugs prescribed here, separated by comma. And then these are the labels uh, of the, like the main section of the disease and also the subsection here that was labeled by the model. And something that was real surprising, we, we did all this for like millions of transactions. And when, once we sent the results to the, uh, these uh, pharmacists, uh, a bunch of doctors, and they were like surprised and they told us like, how much knowledge do you guys have in pharmacy and drugs and diseases? And we said like zero. And it, it, the guy said, oh wow, this is like 80%, 90% accurate. I mean, all these labels. And I mean, that's the power of data mining, right? And machine learning, you don't necessarily need any knowledge in the domain or in that data set necessarily. You can just apply, like build a machine learning model Make some prediction, even without knowing what that data is, or what does it really mean. But of course, domain's knowledge sometimes helps to improve, to do feature selection, to uh, optimize your model. Or maybe instead of testing like 100 models, if you have some knowledge, you can just reduce it to like maybe just five models, to compare five models and see which one is the best. Okay, so obviously domain's knowledge is gonna help, but even if you don't have any information, no one's gonna help you, you still have the opportunity to extract information, useful information out of the data set, like this one. The next idea that came to mind was association rule mining. You know why? Just look at every prescription as a transaction and every drug as an item. 
Okay, so that's why I put like the drugs as items, right? Like every drug is like a potato, a onion, burger, and then the prescriptions are the transactions because they're the items that came together in one prescription. So if we if you run associated zero mining on this data set, we actually ran it on like 300 millions of prescriptions. And a priori algorithm is like super fast, okay? Um, I think we ran it on like every, I think, yeah, in the whole 300 million, well, we had some like servers and cloud computing, but it ran in like one second. In one second, we got all the rules, you know, out of all this data. So a priori is like super fast. Even if you run it on your own computer with uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions, it's gonna run in like seconds. It's gonna run in seconds, super fast. And uh, we came up with some associations like this. For example, if these two drugs, I don't even know what they are, I can't even pronounce them, something, okay? If these two come together with 92% confidence, this is also gonna be in the prescription, right? And the support is like 0. 0.0000, well this is huge, because if you multiply the transactions, 300 million, it's gonna be some number. It's gonna be like, I don't know, 100, it's gonna be like 60 something, okay? The same thing here, and so on and so forth. Anyway, again, we passed these associations to the these doctors, and they said, wow, how did you find this? Okay, they were like shocked. Very simple, just a prior algorithm, and it ran like one second, boom, here's the association. All right, now, how can this be useful? And that's, that's a question, right? It comes to mind. Well, this can be used, I mean, if we come up with these, these set of rules, and uh, we can probably have them uh, in like uh, in every pharmacy. Uh, once they scan every drug, we can do some consistency check with these rules. Okay. And uh, so if, if something is like violating these associations, we can give a notification, you know, to the pharmacy and say, oh, something's going wrong here. One of the drugs is not consistent with the, with, with the rest, for example. Okay. Based on the rules that we've learned from those three hundred million transactions. And you know why? Because. This is really important because medical errors are the third leading cause of death in America. And there, and every year there's like 200, between 200 and 300,000 patients die every year because of medical error. Now medical error is not just like a prescribing the wrong drug, of course. I mean, I think most of these errors and most of these is because of like, a, because of a wrong uh, diagnosis usually, okay? A diagnosis of, of, of the disease. but. But even like maybe, but it's like some of these patients die because of a uh, because of an error in the prescription, and they just got the wrong drug. You know, and they used it, they overdosed, and they died. Okay, that's simple. And then, as I said, it's like the third one in the U.S. Number one is heart disease, and then it's cancer, and then medical errors is the third one. So it's really something serious. I and mean, people, uh, again, it's, there's like some controversial stuff here going on that AI is going to take over all the doctors, and like the doctors are going to go away. AI is going to do like all the diagnosis again at some point. Well, of course, why not? I mean, if, if the accuracy of AI is higher than the doctors, well, we're going to use AI. Why should we go to doctors anymore? Okay. So yeah, just talking about some other um, applications for this model, for this logic overall, these are some ideas we came up with. And as I said, we uh, it's still ongoing. It's, uh, I mean, it's gonna take like a few years to maybe finish all these tasks, but uh, like one of the tasks that we thought of, again, using this data set, even though this data set is like simple, not many features, but it's very valuable. It's very valuable because, again, we can use all this five years data to predict the demand for every drug in the next year. And that means all the pharmacies in every cities, because I mean, back in my home country, well, we have the, some very small cities, you know, that don't really have access to every drug, right? And especially right now, because they're under sanctions, you know, like US sanctions, uh, getting access to like some basic drugs right now is impossible in the country. I know it's some, based on facts, I and mean, I can see that like on a daily basis. And because of that, if we can have this information and pass it over to like these pharmacies, it means that they can have, they can be well prepared, okay, ahead of time. So that if some, some guy has like a, some heart disease and needs some pills right away, they don't have to wait for like a month. They can just get it maybe right away. Okay, so I think this is something very valuable, could be useful. 
and it could be easily extracted from this data just by using some regression models. Regression analysis is going to solve this problem. We can also discover correlations between the drugs and geographical features. Um, or more generally, uh, remember those labels that I mentioned, like every prescription was labeled by a disease? We can do like a heat map for the whole country and show, for example, cancer is happening a lot here and here in that area. And then find some association between that type of cancer and some environmental metrics. For example, maybe some sort of that cancer is because of like polluted water. So it means that in those areas of the country, the water is polluted, most likely. It could be. I mean, again, correlation is not the same as causation, right? We talked about this. But using domain's knowledge and expert, we can come up with a set of these correlations and see which one which ones are causation. And I mean just by getting that information will we can help you save a lot of lives, right? Easily. Um, again, some or build a model to verify prescriptions, which I talked about, like in, in pharmacies and so on and so forth. Anyway, so um, I mean the goal was to show you some application of associated reminding. Uh, not in the retail world, okay? Because associated reminding is well defined in retail, obviously for like, making money, giving recommendations, you know, to customers, and, and increasing the revenue, but. Again, this is something like non-retail. All right, any questions? That's pretty much it. I mean, if you didn't want to go through too much details, that's fine. We'll just give, give you some overview of uh, what kind of stuff you can do with this data, okay? Because, I mean, that was the our first step, because it really happens a lot. Like, the first day, we were actually given this data set, okay? And they told us, like, okay, do some data mining. No, seriously, that's it. That, that's usually how you, if you want to work as a data scientist, in many cases, people are just going to hand over the data set to you and ask for ideas and feedback. Okay? And if you have some experience and knowledge and have like solved different projects and problems, you will probably come up with some ideas right away. And like that's why I was saying like associated mining is used in many of these projects. Once people hand over data sets, it's the first thing, you, it's very quick and you can run it right away and get some results find associations and see if it could be useful or not. I mean, maybe it's not useful. But but anyway, again, again it could, it's something that you can definitely look into. All right, I think I talked too much. Any, any questions, any comments, ideas, feedback? Or anything? All right. Web scraping and R. You want to take a break, maybe? Two minutes? Three minutes? All right, three minutes. Okay, so let's take a, yeah. We're going to be back at 7.52. Uh, 7.52, okay? And then do web scraping and R. So if you want to take the restroom, drink some water.
All right, folks, let's continue. Web scraping in R. And uh, last time we talked about some, uh, some basics, right? And uh, we defined like, what does web scraping mean. And then tonight, we just want to do it in R, OK? And uh, we want to build a, a web scraper, which is going to automatically navigate through the web, click on some buttons, and uh, you know, do some cool stuff for us, OK? But again, there's many details in R Selenium but uh, we're just gonna cover like some very basic navigation, okay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the same thing, same concept. Yes. All right, and I think we talked about this before or last time. Uh, we're gonna create some test scripts. Now, these test scripts can be in any language, okay? We're gonna do it in R, but obviously you can do it in C++, you can do it in Java, any language. And then this test script is gonna be using a web driver, which is called Selenium. Okay. And the web driver is going to control the browser. So that's why when we do like see, uh, what is it, our 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 driver function, um, it will open the Chrome browser. Okay. And uh, we're going to be using the Chrome browser browser because it's easier to access the HTML source code. For every component, you'll see. I'll, I'll explain why. Okay. I've tried it on Safari and uh, Firefox and Chrome, but Chrome is a lot easier. All right, this is all about like, getting, getting it set up, which we talked about before. Now let's get into code, okay? Let's create some real um, scripts, uh, some real script that will 